This is Sports Talk with Phil Kornblut and Chris Bergen. Sports Talk is heard across the state on radio affiliates of the Sports Talk Media Network and is streaming live on SportstalkSC.com as well as Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. The South Carolina Education Lottery lucky number to call in is 888-898-2525. That's 888-898-2525. Now, here are Phil and Chris with tonight's edition of Sports Talk. Hi, good evening, everybody. Welcome into Sports Talk, Sports Talk Media Network. Big Thursday night for you as we come to you from along the coast, over in Sardis, and, of course, back in Columbia. Josh Cohen holding things down for us there and taking your phone calls at 888-898-2525. I've come down to the coast, got a little event taking place this weekend, so I'll be off tomorrow night. It'll all be Bergies tomorrow from the Bergy Palace Woo-hoo! in Sardis. I know you are chomping at the bit to handle everything, and I'll be more than happy to give it to you. I actually had, speaking of you having an event this weekend, I had a, a source close to me wanted me to ask you tonight about your football playing days under Eddie Rice. Ha! Huh. Well, I saw your text. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, look, let's to be. I'm not going to sit here and blow smoke. To be completely honest, I didn't play football after the ninth grade. Um, somehow, I was convinced I was going to be a basketball and baseball player. So mm-hmm. I was 145 pounds and figured that I'd get crushed out there. So really regret like it. Though. It's the only thing that I regret. I regret not continuing to play football in high school because I know how much fun football is and what it and what it can do for you. So anything anybody told you about that would be a bold-faced lie. <laughs> so the fourth and sixth drop in the playoffs was inaccurate? That was not me. We did have that happen. <laughs> we did have that happen against Lakeview, if that's what the – I think it was Lakeview, maybe Johnsonville, if that's what your source was talking mm-hmm. about. But, no, that was not me. That was, unfortunately, <laughs> somebody else. I would have dropped it probably had I, you know, been in the game. I probably would have dropped it. But, no, it didn't. Did not involve me, so. All right, fair enough, fair enough. I'm I glad would, to get I the would, record straight. I would cut that source of yours. Yeah. I would cut that well, source Well, he's a of mutual yours. source of ours, so you mm. take it for what it's worth. <laughs> hey, <laughs> how about uh, our man Joe Cashin, longtime voice of uh, Coastal Carolina, announcing today that he is retiring from that position. Yeah, uh, really interesting situation with Joe. I knew this was coming. He had talked with us on the broadcast team uh, that he was considering even before this season began that this might be his last year doing football. He's been with the Coastal Football Program and the uh, radio crew since football's inception at CCU. So he's been around a long, long time, 21 years, and figured, I guess, what better way to go out than with the Hawaii Bowl? I mean, it's really difficult to top a trip to Honolulu, so – he is hanging up the microphone after a, a very, very solid career at CCU. Well, I tell you, think the world of Joe, not just that his play-by-play, well. play, but his history, his background. Mm-hmm. Many may not know he's a veteran. He did uh, a tour, multiple tours of uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, whatever the case may be. I don't know exactly. I don't want to date him in a partic- into a particular mm-hmm. war. But he's a doggone lot braver than some of us are. And he continued his career in the South Carolina National Guard and rising up the ranks there. So I uh, thank him for his service. I congratulate him on his service and also congratulate him on a on a terrific uh, broadcasting career. A great guy, a good friend of ours. And who knows? Who knows who might step into those shoes uh, for the 2024 season, Mr. Bergen? I would certainly enjoy that opportunity that is out of my uh, pay grade, but that is certainly something I would enjoy. I've been working with Coastal Football. I went back to double check since 2016. I've actually been broadcasting for CCU since 07. Mm-hmm. I had not realized until I ran across my resume a couple of days ago just uh, cleaning out some stuff in the computer, and I was like, holy cow. I did not realize I'd been, it had been that long since I stopped doing PC and started working with Coastal. And so, yeah, I would uh, certainly – do you want to talk about big shoes to fill? Joe had them sitting in to fill in for Matt Hogue, and whomever comes in after Cashin will have to fill in for those two guys. So, yeah, definitely not an easy thing. And I've actually filled in for Joe on a couple of occasions. When I got my start working with football was when Joe was on his tour 
over in the Middle East. And uh, my first game, I think, on the sidelines that year with Matt still doing play-by-play was at West Virginia. I got to go to Morgantown, which was pretty cool. And then during the thousand-year flood, I believe it was, when Joe and the uh, South Carolina National Guard were called up to uh, handle traffic and, you know, closing off roads and the whole nine yards, Coastal actually bumped a game. It may have been actually a hurricane coming through. I can't remember which. But they were supposed to play Campbell on a Saturday afternoon in Conway. They moved that game to a Wednesday, and actually uh, it was played in Bowie's Creek. Well, Joe couldn't go because the uh, South Carolina National Guard and his unit had been activated. So uh, Lane Harris, who does a remarkably good job with the color, he and I went up to uh, up there to uh, Bowie's Creek for a rare Wednesday afternoon college football matinee. And so that was a lot of fun. I bet. <laughs> so <laughs> it was a little different, that's for sure. Well, listen, whatever works out, hope it works out for the best for you. Uh, that's a great Thank job. You. That is a great job, no question about it, because that's a that's a growing program. But here we go again, another big name veteran associated with Coastal Athletics stepping out after uh, this school year. We've seen mm-hmm. started with uh, well started with Gilly, and then Cliff Ellis, uh, and then Matt Hogue, and now uh, Joe Cashin. Am I missing anybody? No, I don't believe so. I think that's it in terms of retirements within the athletic department. And, and I guess you can lump in Joe Moglia, too, who's going to make yeah, a transition yeah. out of his football role at uh, the same time that Matt makes his transition over into the uh, broadcast teaching realm of his career. So, yeah, they've they've had quite the turnover. And, and Matt was joking about me being the only one still left. There are still a few of us old veterans, if you will. Mm-hmm. I'm not the oldest one still left. But, uh, yeah, it, it is a uh, era of change in Conway for sure. Well, you're gaining on being the oldest one. You're getting there. <laughs> Hang in there long enough, and you will be the oldest one. Good luck. Hope it goes well. They could not do better than you. I will say that. They could not do better than you. And makes sense. You're the voice of Shauna Clear basketball. Why not? Uh, you know, it just depends on the philosophy. Some schools mm-hmm. don't like having one person uh, doing football and basketball. Some schools do like having one person doing football and basketball so uh, as long as it doesn't impact you and sports talk i'm all for it so well i just don't want our uh from a selfish standpoint our radio broadcast team i was joking with joe when we found out that he a couple of weeks back that he officially was going to step away i said you can't break up the fantastic four Hmm. because i've always felt like we have a very very strong broadcast team uh joe and and lane in the booth joe katz who does coastal baseball he's the on-site producer and i was down on the field and we all got along extremely well, and I thought it was a seamless uh, broadcast. So uh, hopefully we'll be able to maintain, at least with Joe out of the mix, hopefully we'll still be able to maintain the majority of that team together because I think it works really well. Oh, you guys do a great and job. And that's enough of me patting myself in no. our group on the back. No, y'all do a great job. I've heard well, you, thank you, you do a great job, uh, and I hope it goes your way. Um, all right, phone number 888 898 Hello, Clemson. Yeah, wake-up call. <laughs> Game has started. Uh, you you might say the Tigers have them right where they want them. Yeah, no doubt. Considering no doubt. how they like to come from behind. Boston College still batting in the top of the first. They've put five on the board, three hits, and two errors on Clemson. Wake up. Wake up, Tigers. You're down to the worst team in the ACC, or one of the worst. Um, and they've got a three-run homer in the inning. They've got uh, an unearned run scored. And they've got a run off of a single. So 5 nothing, Boston College starting for Clemson today, Darden. And, uh, boy, I tell you what, he's not long for this game. He doesn't pick it up, but his defense didn't help him. Yeah. Only two of the only um, – no, uh, let's see. Uh, only one of those runs is mm-hmm. earned. Yeah, five runs. Uh, one is earned. Uh, still goes on the board. It's five runs, though. So Right. Um, and they're still batting top of the first two are away. South Carolina, Tennessee getting underway at 630. Gamecocks have uh, inserted Talmadge LeCroy back in the lineup at shortstop. And Cassis has gone back to third. uh, And Petri is uh, back at first tonight. So they're going with the more offensive lineup. And uh, they've got uh, Brindling uh, leading off, followed by Petri. uh, Jackson in right, Messina behind the plate. Nolan at second, Jones in left. Reeves DHing, Lee Croy at short, Cassis at third, and then Ty Good on the mound tonight. So um, they had um, 
Tippett at shortstop there for what? A couple of games um, playing defense, and uh, that allowed them to take Cassis, put him back at first, put Petrie back in the outfield, but they're going to go with LeCroy at the short tonight, and I guess they, they feel like his bat – Uh, is going to be necessary against this potent Tennessee offense tonight, an offense that averages nine and a half runs per game. Well, and this is the lineup that uh, Mark Kingston went with during the Kentucky series, pretty much the same batting order. You can flip-flop Blake Jackson and Parker Nolan. Nolan has not swung it all that well here of late, hoping to get him out of it, and they need him to sitting there in the middle of the order. But this is that offense that scored nine, ten runs of all game. I mean, this is clearly their best offensive uh, hopes in terms of their nine. Tippett probably gives him a little bit better defense, but when you put him in, then you've got to move some guys around as well so he can get his glove in there. And I think from an offensive standpoint, this is the group they've got to run with. Okay, uh, Coastal Carolina underway in the top of the first, playing at Marshall. Shauna Clears had the bases loaded with one out in a scoreless game, obviously a game that they need uh, to win in the worst way. And the College of Charleston, Looking to get to 40 wins. They'll be right around 40 wins if they take care of business this weekend. They're up on Elon 13-9 in the bottom of the seventh. So, But we've seen Charleston blow bigger leads here recently. So we're not going to count this one in the win column yet. There's still some baseball to be played. Looks like Sink Sank's having another uh, good day for uh, the Cougars, taking a look at uh, some of their numbers. They've hit a couple of home runs. Uh, one by Sing Sank, who's also got uh, a total of three RBIs on the game thus far. 17 hits for the Cougars. So they are rounding into shape. But again, we all know for them it's going to boil down to that CAA tournament at Wilmington next week. Well, and it was interesting when we had Chad Holbrook on, I think it was last week, and he was lobbying, uh, sort of pulling a Brad Brownell, lobbying for the CAA to get more than just one team in. He'd like to see both his team, obviously, and then UNC Wilmington, it believes. And I agree with him. I think they both deserve an opportunity to play in the postseason. But if you watched the projections that came out yesterday, D1 Baseball, Baseball America, Neither one of them, I know D1 Baseball, I didn't scrutinize the Baseball America one closely enough, but neither one of them I don't think put two in. And D1 Baseball actually had UNC Wilmington in over over the college. So it's going to boil down to next weekend for, I think, both of those teams. Whoever wins that tournament gets in. What you don't want to see happen if you're the CAA is to have some three, four, five, six, seven seed run through and win it and then have realistically no shot to perform well in the NCAA tournament. These are your two best teams. You've got to find a way to get them into the postseason. Yeah. North Greenville getting underway with their game against uh, Georgia College and State University in the Southeast Regional of the uh, NCAA Division II tournament. That game is just getting underway up in Tigerville. So we'll uh, keep you up to date on the score of that one as Landon Powell tries to get his team back to the – Division II World Series. Of course, they won the national championship a couple of years ago. We'll keep an eye on that. Mentioned the College of Charleston. Don't count it yet. They've uh, given up a couple of runs here in the bottom of the seventh, so it's 13-10 to as they play in the top of the eighth. Let's turn our attention to the PGA Championship, where the scores today in the opening round at Valhalla, at least by one guy, has been really, really, really good. Xander Shoffley goes out and shoots a 62 that's nine under par, and he has the lead by three shots over Tony Finau and Sahith Thigala there at six under after a 65. And here's Roy McIlroy, I told you, considering his <laughs> personal troubles, that he would be well-focused in this tournament for him a good start. A five under 66 puts him in a tie for fourth with Robert McIntyre, also, Ben Coles is at minus four, and Brooks Kepka minus 467, and also Taylor Moore, four under 67. Tom Kim on the course at four under, along with Thomas Dietrich. They are at four under. That's tied for sixth. And then tied for 11th, Adam Hadwin at 68, minus three. Martin Keimer, Cameron Smith, Victor Hovland right there at minus three. Max Homa at minus three. Kurt Kitayama. And Byron DeChambeau, also at minus three. They're in the clubhouse on the course at minus three. Got quite a few. Tom Hoagie, Jason Duffner, Colin Morikawa. Uh, Here's Scotty Scheffler, minus three. He's got several holes left to make a move. And uh, Mark Hubbard is in at minus three. 
As far as some others, um, we have got uh, – see, we haven't mentioned anybody that we follow. Uh, Justin Thomas, 2 under 69. Jordan Spieth, 2 under 69. Phil Mickelson, a 1 under – he is 1 under uh, through 14 ho- holes today. Uh, oh, Lucas Glover, even yes. par, 71. So he is in the tournament. Yeah, and even to par, mention 71 that since we were him. Yeah. talking about whether or not he's going to be able to attend the – Hall of Fame ceremonies on Monday. That may be the reason why. If he makes the cut and plays the weekend, he may not be available on Monday. Sure. Tiger Woods, 72. That's plus one. Uh, Dustin Johnson, remember him? He plays golf. Uh, two over 73. And John Rahm, two over through 13 holes. And Michael Block, who is a five over, 76 for his round today. And there you go. Uh, of course, uh, I think Michael has some connections to our state, does he not? That's why we're mentioning him. Well, he's the one who favorites. last year, he's the one, if I'm not mistaken, last year had that great run. He's one of the PGA pros that actually got in the PGA championship and had the uh, tremendous ah, run and had about it. 15 minutes of fame. Isn't that him? That's and him. And yeah, then yeah, played yeah. the next week. He got a uh, tour exemption and played the next week, and yep. we haven't heard from him since. Yeah. You talked yeah. about you talked about Shoffley 62. That actually tied the uh, low round in men's major championship history. It's a record he already shares with the likes of Ricky Fowler and Brandon Grace. Sh- uh, Shoffley shot a 62 last year at the U.S. Open. And then you touched on Scotty Scheffler. He got off to a minus two start on the first hole. He knocked it in from the fairway for an eagle and has sort of just been trading water ever since. We will have more from Valhalla in Louisville from MJ. MJ Ward will be joining us here at the bottom of the hour to give us more insight on today's opening round of the second major championship of the year, the PGA. And um, College of Charleston got out of that inning without any further damage, so they're still up. 13-10, 13-10, to 10, and Clemson's now batting in the bottom of the first, trailing 5 to nothing. You have a feeling this is going to be maybe something along the lines of 15-10, to 10, the way this game started out? You wonder if that's going to ease, even if they win it, you wonder if that's going to set some uneasy feelings in that Clemson dugout heading into the ACC tournament, considering, now in fairness, Ethan Darden got no help from his defense in the opening inning. That being said, you don't want to trail Boston College 5 nothing. You don't want to have to outslug them. You feel like you should have a much better pitching staff that can keep them at bay, and they may. I mean, they may go out, and that may be all Boston College gets. I kind of doubt it, but... You know, you score five runs in the first, you anticipate having to score about 10 to win that game. That's probably not the the momentum you want to take into the postseason. Yeah, I mean, listen, I've been questioning their pitching here going on a mm-hmm. good while. Uh, they're just giving up too many runs. They're giving up too many double-digit uh, totals in games, and I don't think that's going to carry you very far when you get to postseason play. I mean, you might outslug a few people, but I think eventually that's going to that's gonna catch up with you. And, you know, they don't, can't afford a poor showing against Boston College if they want to hang on to a top eight seed uh, as they're being projected to uh, at this point for the NCAA baseball tournament, the regionals, um, they better win at least two out of three against these folks. Okay. Um, anything else big going on you want to pass along? Have we covered everything? Uh, Dick Sheridan's going into the Southern Conference Hall of Fame, former Fer- uh, Furman coach. Um, that's about uh, outside of that and the PGA championship, pretty much the big stories of the day thus far, uh, excuse me, thus far. Okay. Our phone number, triple eight, eight, nine, eight, two, five, two, five. And let's go to Gamecock Larry for our leadoff call tonight. Once again, this is not uh, groundhog day. He just calls every day at this time. It's Gamecock Larry. Welcome in Gamecock Larry. How are you? I'm doing just fine. Mr. Phil, I got a, so something in the mail today is a bottle of medication. And I called my pharmacist out there at the VA, and I said, what in the world is this stuff? She says this, she said it's melatonin or something like that. Oh, said, that's good for? stuff. And, that's good and, stuff. And I, said, I said, what's that for? She said, something to help you go to sleep. I said, I don't need nothing to help me go to sleep. I need something to keep me sleeping for a while. Well, that's what well, it'll I'll do. I'll tell you what. But, okay. But let me tell you something. Mm. Going into the final weekend of the series, I have, I can't remember where a coach says the second and third game of that series is TBA. Mm. But I'm going to tell you what's wrong with this 
coaching staff. It is DKW. Don't know who. And that's for the whole lineup and everything. That's about all I got to say. I might not even listen to it. Yeah, I'm going to listen to it. You're going to listen. You got nothing else to yeah. do. You're going to listen. listen to you. I'm going to listen. I'm going to listen to you for a while. <laughs> well, let's look. Listen now. I know you're going to turn to the baseball game, and that's fine, but you can keep us on the radio. But uh, Ty Good could be the answer tonight. A good outing by Ty Good on a day where former Gamecock Clark Schmidt uh, pitched a shutout into the ninth inning, uh, as the Yankees won, by the way, at Minnesota. They gave up one run in that entire series, by the way. So my point is, good vibes from a former Gamecock might trickle down to tie good tonight, and he might be excellent, give the Gamecocks some length on the mound, save that bullpen. Then, I don't know, they they may come back with uh, Ganey tomorrow, spring him on Tennessee since he was uh, so good his last time out, or they might tr- roll the dice and see if um, if uh, Eli Jones is ready to go and going to get back to uh, form after um, – doing some stuff uh, on the mound and doing some tinkering and figuring some things out. So uh, we shall there see. There you go. That's what TBA there means. You... TBA means we shall see. W-S-S. DKW, don't know who. Don't know who. That's well, there's a light. I'm just going to tell you, based on the pitching we're seeing around college baseball and the runs being scored, there's a lot of coaches who don't know who. <laughs> Would you agree with that, Chris? I would absolutely, uh, unless you're in the Arkansas dugout. Unless yeah. you're Dave Van Horn, you you pretty much don't know who. All right, thank you, Mister Larry. You go, go take your melatonin, then and and, and uh, I tell you what, a combination of us and melatonin guaranteed to put you into dreamland. I mean, mm-hmm. real deep, real deep uh, dreams there. So go enjoy yourself. <laughs> I think I need to. Take about a bottle of that stuff myself, be honest with you. Uh, 888-898-2525 is the number. Clemson does not score in their half of the first, so they go to the top of the second. It's 5 nothing. Coastal and Marshall are scoreless as well at the end of one, and it is College of Charleston up on Elon, 13-10, but the Cougars are threatening first and second with one out uh, looking to add more. Um We'll talk about this uh, coming up as well, and we're monitoring the um, North Greenville game. They haven't started yet, so uh, we'll keep you up on that game as uh, as it progresses. So, um, you know, Dabo Sweeney did some interviews from uh, down at the uh, ACC uh, spring meetings, and uh, def- basically uh, uh, I'm not going to say he defended his position about not taking anybody out of the portal, John, but he – Definitely shrugged it, shrugged it off as far as being asked about it, and you know said, "Look, our, we take transfers." Is how he put it in one interview. Uh, high school players, their transfers are transferring from high school to us, so they're transfers. In other words, he's he's not taking it real seriously. Mm-hmm. This the questioning about not taking anybody out of the transfer portal. He's sticking to his guns about it, and you know what? He'll either be proven right or wrong. Uh, they continue to recruit at a high level. If you buy into the recruiting rankings, this this um, 2024 class that they brought in was nationally ranked, and the 2025 class that they're putting together right now is very highly ranked. So how can you complain about that if you're a Clemson fan? You can't, and it's obviously a hill that Dabo is going to die on. Part of the problem he's getting today is he was on Sirius XM radio in uh, in an interview with Roddy Jones. He made the comment, and this is all anybody sees. I mean, it's really pretty simple. This is his quote. Most of the guys in the portal aren't good enough to play for us. That's just hmm. the reality of it. Hmm. Now, if you read further, he went on to say, I mean, we have guys that are backups at Clemson that go in the portal because they just want to have an opportunity, and most of them are graduates, by the way, but we have guys that are backups. They want a chance to play. I've got no problem with that, so rarely, and I think here's where he's right, rarely do we have a starter leave Clemson. The problem is that's not what's getting out nationally. What everybody's seeing is the fact that guys in the portal aren't good enough to play for us. When you see play- programs that have passed his now in Georgia and Ohio State and Michigan and Florida State taking guys out of the transfer portal, well, if they can play there, they certainly can play at Clemson, you would think. Absolutely. I would have to push back on that comment quite a bit. You know, mm-hmm. 
I mean, I can think of some players South Carolina's taken from the portal who could have played at Clemson. Uh, I think sure. Spencer Rattler could have gotten some snaps. Yeah, I would agree. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think a little receiver named Juice Wells might have gotten some snaps. We'll be back. Welcome back, everybody. It's Sports Talk on a big Thursday night across the state of South Carolina. Sports Talk Media Network. Phil Cornblue, Chris Bergen, Josh Cohen. Want to join us? 888-898-2525 is the number. Lines are open. Uh, Baseball has taken away the attention of some, so that just opens up the lines and gives you more room to join us. Should you care to, we will be hooking up with MJ Ward at some point, maybe sooner than later, but at some point we will hook up with him and get his thoughts from the PGA Championship, where in round one it is Xander Shoffley setting the pace at 9-under 62. What a terrific round for him as he started on the outward nine. I try to sound like an Englishman when I talk, talk golf. He started on the outward nine, and he birdied a five uh, going out. So 31 on his front nine, and then he had four birdies coming in, which was the first nine. So he did not have a bogey on the card today. 31, 31, 62. Boy, I'd love to sign for a 62 one day. <laughs> that would just yes. be too pretty. That'd be too pretty. But it in ain't nine never, holes, ever, ever. That's less 18. <laughs> I know. I know. It's one of those things that you like, you know, what do you know in sports you're never going to do? Like, I know I'm never going to dunk a basketball. Like, mm-hmm. I know I'm never going to shoot 62. Like, now I've hit a home run in baseball, high school, so I can do that. I've done a home run thing. Uh, what else can I do? I've dropped a critically important fourth down pass opportunity in the playoffs. That's a fable. That's a fable. <laughs> it never happened. It never happened. But, yeah, 62, never going to happen. No, no. Never going to happen. Uh, Finau and Thigala next at the 65. So, uh, nothing else has changed since our last update of significance. Uh, Morikawa, I think he's moved up a little bit. He's at minus four, so he's moved up to t- uh, tied for six. Scotty Scheffler is minus four. He also is tied for six as they're playing the uh, the backside. Uh, Scheffler's through 13, and Morikawa is through 14. Update I would the enjoy John Daly's uh, round today on a regular basis. Now, he's 11 over par, but that's an 82. I think I'd sign up for that. Every time out. I'd kill for 82. I'd be, I'd be more than happy to take that every time out. Uh, South Carolina's taking the one nothing lead. Petri with a homer to left. I think that's 20 for him on the season, isn't it? Double check his stats. So a home run by Petri. Two left. Solo home run with one out. Puts the Gamecocks up one to nothing. And they're still batting in the top of the first with two men out. So Ty Good will come to the mound with a, a lead. When he goes to the bottom of the first. Meantime, up at Doug Kingsmore, bottom of the second. Clemson trailing Boston College five to nothing. Tigers have runners on the corners, and no one is out. Coastal Carolina with a one nothing lead on Marshall, bottom of the second. College of Charleston, fourteen to ten on Elon in the bottom of the eighth. And uh, top of the first, just underway, North Greenville and Georgia. Georgia College and State University playing in the Division II Regional in Tigerville. No score there. Uh, they're in the top of the first. And you so are correct. That was, that. That, was Petri's, that was Petri's 20th of the season. You know, he's been largely, obviously, uh, largely overshadowed by uh, Condon at Georgia mm-hmm. in his power explosion. But you can't overlook what Petri's done. This is back-to-back no. 20-plus home run seasons for him in his two years at South Carolina. Now you have to be concerned. Now, he's not eligible for the draft. Um, and he has said that, you know, he wants to stay at South Carolina, loves it, da-da-da-da. But let's face it, man, you're going to have to deal with keeping him on the roster uh, for 2025 because you know there will be some temptation. There will be, you know, he's from Florida, uh, Florida, Florida State. There will be people probably trying to lure him away. Mark Kingston, they're going to have to not only recruit 
JUCOs and transfers and high schools going to have to re-recruit some on their own roster, mm-hmm. I'm afraid. Gary Gilmore told me one time that coaching juniors in college baseball is the most difficult thing to do because they realize they're draft eligible. They want to have a good year to show off for the major league scouts who come watch them play. And it's tough on them because there's a lot of pressure. I mean, Petrie's swung it uh, fairly freely the first two seasons because he didn't have to worry about the draft. You wonder next year, is he going to bat over 300? Is he going to have over 20 home runs? Is he going to drive in 60? It's, it's not the easiest thing in the world to do. And then, he, you know, if he doesn't perform as well, comes back his senior year, then maybe he has a better year. I'm not saying he won't have an outstanding year next year. I just, having talked to Coach before, he said juniors are tough to coach just the way the setup, that's not just on Ethan, that's every junior in college baseball. Um, and the thing, too, is if he stays on at South Carolina, I mean, he's going to be challenging some of the home, home uh, all-time Absolutely. home run records mm-hmm. at at South Carolina. Um, what, Hank Small, I guess, holds the record for uh, career home runs at South Carolina, which I think, not knowing off the top of my head, I'd have to look it up in the record book. I'm going to say it's somewhere like in the 60s, maybe. Does that sound right? About 60-something home runs? Like I could look it up, but I'm just going off the top of my head there. He has another. Well, first of all, this year's not done. Right. Now, he could end up around, depending on how long the season goes, he could end up in the neighborhood of he's at 20, Shoot, he could end up around 26, 27 home runs being conservative. He could get red hot and touch 30. That's asking a lot here considering, you know, they've got this game and two more and then at least one game in the SEC tournament. So that's four games. Then assuming they make the NCAA, at least two games there. So at a minimum, six more games ahead for him. Be hard to hit 10 homers in six games. I'd yeah, say. you would think so. And, and keep in mind, Justin Smoke hit 62. Maybe it's Smoke who is the record holder. I was pulling up. I'm trying to – it's not the easiest thing to do, except uh, unless I grab their media guide. Uh, that would take too much time. But I pulled up a uh, NCAA story that, that they had done years ago, ranking the uh, top ten players at USC in baseball history. It's funny. They don't even have Hank Small on the list. Well, that's crazy. <laughs> I would agree. No, I, I mean, seriously, that's just plain mm-hmm. stupid. Um I mean, he's got. He is one of the uh, top all-time uh, players right. in South Carolina history, uh, All-American and uh, home run hitter galore. Let's see. I've opened up the media guide, and I'm going to see if I can do a quick glance through here and and find the record real quick and tell you so we can satisfy satisfy our curiosity on this individual batting records. This should tell us, right? You would think. There's doubles. Who do you think the all-time doubles leader is at South Carolina? Okay, that's that is um, that's by the game. I need career. Give me career here. Sacrifice uh, three hits game. This looks like career. Um, oh, that is okay. It's all mixed together. So home runs, home runs, home runs, triples, home runs. Um, let's see, home runs. Season twenty nine. Your own Peters. Mm-hmm. Back in 2002. Petri um, was chasing after that last year, you remember. Yeah, 23. All right, it is Justin Smoke. Justin Smoke, 62 from 2006 to 2008 in 194 games. Uh, Hank Small, okay, Hank Small hit 48 home runs. He's the all-time home run hitter as a right-hander, and he wow. hit 48 okay. from 72 to 75. Jeff Parnell all-time leader as a left-hander. This would be a good trivia question because Justin Smoke was a switch hitter. Was a switch hitter, yeah. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and he right. hit 62. Um, Jeff Parnell, who was a great power hitter, he hit 45. So he has the record as a pure left-handed hitter. And Trey Dyson has the record for homers in consecutive games, five, back <laughs> in 2000. Yeah, he was a really good power hitter, left-handed yes, he was. hitter. I think underrated, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm glad we solved that because I was really, you know, <laughs> getting concerned about so, you know, the answer to that question. You know, Ethan Petrie would have to stay four years to even challenge, I think, Justin Smoke. I mean, it just puts into perspective. We're watching power numbers go out the wazoo, and you've got mm-hmm. probably the best power hitter that the Gamecocks have, and he has just passed 40 home runs. So, you know, I guess it's possible he could do that next year. Yeah, Get past absolutely. Justin Smoke. Mm-hmm. All right, a couple of other things, and our phone number, 888-898-2525. That is the South Carolina Education 
lottery lucky number. We have a preseason FCS poll came out today. This is by Hero Sports, and Furman is ranked 14th in the preseason ranking by Hero Sports. South Dakota State is ranked number one, followed by North Dakota State, Montana, Montana State, South Dakota, Villanova, Idaho, Sacramento State, Southern Illinois, and UT Chattanooga. And Furman is number 14. Uh, Something else I saw today worth talking about, and this was on um, CBSSports.com. And, you know, I don't get carried away with these rankings that these sites put out during this time of the year because it's just something to fill time with, you know, somebody's opinion about the top this, the top that. So they have ranked the um, group of five football coaches, okay? The group of five football coaches. The number one ranked group of five football coach is none other than Jamie Jamie Chadwell. Chadwell. Mm -hmm. Jamie Chadwell. I mean, look, Jamie Chadwell has won everywhere mm-hmm. where he's been a head coach. I mean, from North Greenville to Charleston Southern to Delta State to um, Coastal Carolina, now at Liberty in one year. The guy's just a winner. His system that he coaches, that he designed, I guess he designed this offense, the one that he runs, I mean, it works, and he surrounds himself yes, with – very good coaches, and he recruits good players to operate that offense. So he is very deserving, and, I mean, somebody's going to gobble him up big, big time in the next year or two, probably after next year, if they have another big season at Liberty, you know. I'm not suggesting they go undefeated and make it to a major bowl game like they did this past season, but still, another strong year, shoot, somebody's going to grab him in a big-time capacity. And the brilliance of his spread option attack is he's able to get high school quarterbacks who sort of run that system at the high school level. It may not be a straight spread option, but a lot of option, uh, you know, a lot of option priorities, I guess, and principles in that attack that a lot of high schools still run. And then the ability to throw the football, too. And most of your high school quarterbacks are the best athletes on their team. So you put them in Jamie's system, and, and it works out spades because everywhere he's been, you pointed out, he's had guys that can run that system and do it extremely well. Grayson McCall, a prime example. I mean, three-time Big South, uh, excuse me, Sunbelt Player of the Year, and a lot of it was early in his career being able to run that offense. And so, yeah, I, I agree with you. And, you know, it'd be funny, it'd be interesting if Clark Lee continues to struggle at Vanderbilt. You know, Jamie is a Tennessee guy. Would Vanderbilt make that that call, pull him in to run a unique offense in the SEC and just see if that might turn their fortunes around? You know, you and I were talking about this uh, off air, but it's worth um, talking about on air. As you mentioned, um, Grayson, and now Grayson being at NC State, and I think that makes NC State a very serious contender in the ACC simply because he's there and uh, he can make everybody around him uh, that much better. So, like, who do you rank? Where does he rank among the top quarterbacks in the ACC? I'm, I'm looking at this one ranking, and Cam Ward. You got to remember now the ACC is flooded with transfer quarterbacks. Yeah, there aren't many returning quarterbacks who were there on, with their team last year. Um, which you know, and, and I'm looking here. Where is um, Cade Klubnick ranked in this particular ranking. He's ranked the fifth quarterback in the ACC behind Haynes King at Georgia Tech, who's back for another year there after transferring. Chiron Drones, who's at Virginia Tech, and he had a big year last year, over 2,000 passing yards, 17 touchdowns, only three interceptions. He rushed for 800 yards. They rank Uyangale number two at Florida State. Even though his numbers last season were pretty, I mean, they weren't off the charts. 2,600 yards, 21 touchdowns, but he only completed 57%. Seven interceptions. He only rushed for 200 yards, seven touchdowns. You put him as the number two, and the number one, they list Cameron Ward, who is um, another transfer. I think he came from Houston, didn't he? 
want to say he came from Houston to Miami. This guy, 67% completion, 3,700 yards, 25 passing touchdowns, seven picks, rushed for 144 yards and eight touchdowns. So that's who this particular group sees as the top quarterback, and they have Klubnik at uh, at number five. I mean, he's got to play better than the number five quarterback in the league for Clemson to have a chance to win the championship and get to the playoffs, I would say. Agreed. Agreed. And uh, Grayson, I think, is an unknown. First off, how healthy is he? That's been his biggest bugaboo, and that's the, the only thing that's held him back at Coastal is his inability to be able to stay on the field and stay healthy. If he's yeah. able to do so at NC State, he's got all the tools to be an entirely different offense. But it's more what he tried to play in this year before he got hurt at Arkansas State under Tim Beck because Tim Beck, you know, the quarterback coach guru that came from NC State, now the head coach at Coastal. So Grayson's got a pretty good idea, I think, of what they have run at NC State and felt like that'd be a good fit for him. But we've got to see if he can make it through an entire season, first off, it, you know, it, against ACC competition versus Sunbelt competition. Well, and you talk about some of these other transfer quarterbacks. you got Kyle McCord at Syracuse. I mean, that's a big-time pickup. For mm-hmm. them, this is a guy that completed 66% through for 3,200 yards and 24 touchdowns. That's a major step up, and they have a new coach, of course. Uh, also, you've got – and you consider these new teams like SMU. Preston Stone is considered to be a very good quarterback, 3,200 yards, 28 passing touchdowns last season. So he comes in with some big-time numbers. Chandler Rogers at Cal, 3,400 yards, 29 touchdowns. 62%. Duke took the transfer from Texas. Malik Murphy, who's got all kind of promise, just hadn't played a whole lot. And um, let's see, I think Louisville's quarterback returns. Tyler Schall, uh, I think he was there last year. Maybe he was in a backup role there last year. But I think he's still, I think that's, I think he's still, no, no, I take that back. I take that back. He came from Texas Tech. He was a backup at Texas Tech. Um, and isn't Riley Leonard the former Duke quarterback? Isn't he at Notre Dame now? Yeah, and but he doesn't he count. Up, Notre, Notre Dame's not in the league, you know. They're not in the league. Technically, yeah, count. I guess you're yeah. right. Yeah, he's not in the league. <laughs> Notre Dame's not in the league, but Cal not, is. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that yeah, yeah, doesn't make any sense. But, uh, you know, <laughs> Max Johnson's at North Carolina. I guess he's the heir apparent to step in there as a transfer. A lot of, you know, a lot of new names at quarterback, a lot of big names at quarterback. Eli Holstein used to be at Notre Dame. He's at Pitt now. Uh, after transferring from Alabama. I thought he started at Notre Dame. Maybe I was wrong. Um, he transferred from Alabama. Um, so um, they're expecting him to win the job at at Pitt. Okay, there you go. we got to hit the break on Sports Talk, and we'll be back with more. South Carolina and Tennessee, 1-1. Tennessee still batting. Bottom of the first, Amick with the RBI single. South Carolina kid, hmm. former Clemson third baseman. Yep. Yeah. Gets the RBI single. Clemson's down 6-1. to one. Top of the third. BC has a runner on third. Two outs. Coastal's up 5-1. to one, Top of the third. Charleston in the uh, bottom of the ninth. Leading at Elon. 14-10. to 10. Be back after this break. We're with Major Billy Downer of the Department of Natural Resources. Major Downer, let's say I'm out in the woods or I'm on the water and I need to reach a DNR agent. How do I do that? Operation Game Thief, Phil. It's been around 30-plus years. You can call us at our 24-hour hotline any time of day, 1-800-922-5431. To report wildlife violations or to get help if you're in trouble in the woods or on the water, call us at Operation Game Thief, 1-800-922-5431. Stay tuned. More Sports Talk is coming up on the Sports Talk Media Network. The South Carolina Education Lottery has introduced a new rolling jackpot, and it's big. How big? Bigger than a striped bass? Regular men. Way bigger. Bigger than this world-class golf course? Or Bigger than that. Even bigger than the Gaffney Peach? <laughs> Let's just say with this new rolling jackpot, Palmetto Cash 5 is officially too big to ignore. Palmetto Cash 5 draws nightly, so play today and check if your numbers are winners in the Players Club app or at seeducationlottery.com. Overall odds are 1 in 10. Top prize odds are 1 in 850,668. George Bryant here for Tsunami Bar Sports, and some say the fun is in the winning. I say the fun is in the training, and Tsunami Robbie... What do you say? George, we all know you get more done when you're having fun. This technology is different. It's engaging. 
but it's also a lot of fun to use. Hi, this is Phil Kornblut. Be sure to click on the digital ad on sportstalksc.com and get 5% off any Tsunami Bar order using promo code BBB5. Don't wait. Order today. We are back on Sports Talk. All right, correction. I misspoke. It was a home run by Seymour for Tennessee that accounted for that run. Amick had a single. I saw his stuff in bold letters, and I was thinking maybe he had driven in a run. I missed the home run. Does it matter? One to one, bottom of the first. Tennessee threatening with two outs. Runner on third. Clemson has pulled their starter. They give up a run in the third. They're down 6-1. to one. Darden is pulled after two innings. Four hits, six runs, two earned. Struck out two, hit a batter. So tough outing for him and tough defense behind him. Marshall is on to replace him. And North Greenville's taking a 2 nothing lead on Georgia College and State University in the top of the second. So um, good start for the Crusaders as you knew that they're going to Make this. A, you knew they were going to make the the regional and host and and have a chance to advance. So, got another good team there in uh, in Tigerville as they always do. Uh, let's see what else we got going on. Um, we'll update the PGA for you. We're going to connect with MJ. I guess maybe in the second hour. Got our wires crossed on our timing. So, guess he'll be joining us in the second hour. Uh, Mike Morgan joining us after the top of the hour. Morgan on the move with his thoughts on. The end of the baseball season. We'll talk a little at Atlanta Braves with them as well. Braves have been going pretty well. Got shut out yesterday by the Cubs. But for the most part, things have been going well for them. And uh, we can take your phone calls, too, at 888 2525 That is the South Carolina Education Lottery lucky number. Also want to remind you, getting ready for your summer vacation, make sure you call Jimmy Smith at James Smith Real Estate here in Litchfield and Garden City and Merle's Inlet and uh, Pauly's, all those places, paulysvacationrentals.com. You can uh, talk to Jimmy and tell him what you're looking for as far as your accommodations are concerned, and then tell him the budget, and he'll work with you to find what you're looking for. He or his staff, somebody will get with you and find you exactly what you are looking for for that summer vacation. Maybe you want to buy a house or a condo. Jimmy's more than happy to work with you there as well. He's helped thousands of people find vacation homes and permanent homes here along the beach during his time uh, in operation, which has been a long, long time. His phone number is 843-237-4246 and online at pauliesvacationrentals.com. Okay. um, We will... um, Hear from Mike Morgan, as I mentioned, after the top of the hour break. And a couple of other things I want to touch on are a poll question of the week. Will South Carolina qualify for a bowl game in 2024? Time is running out to vote. 543 votes are in, and 52.1% say yes, 47.9% they say no for um, – the Gamecocks making a bowl game. Uh, you know, the Kentucky game, we didn't mention this last night, the Kentucky game set for a 3.30 kick in Lexington. be a hot afternoon, a hot September afternoon to open up SEC play. That will be on ABC, second game of the season. Gamecocks have won the last two over the Wildcats, and they won up there last time they went. So you're going to see a couple of new quarterbacks here as, as well with Lenore Sellers with the Gamecocks, and uh, I'd have to look and see who Kentucky's plugging in because they plug in a new quarterback almost every year. Yeah, they do, and that's going to be a critically important game, well, obviously for both teams, but I think for USC to get anywhere close to qualifying for a bowl, that's one they've got to put in the win column. Yeah, that's one of those games where it looks like Brock Vandergriff is going to be the Kentucky starting quarterback. Former quarterback at Georgia, never played, Mm -hmm. and so – from what I'm reading, looks like he could be, will be the guy. He was highly recruited coming out of high school. So two 
inexperienced young quarterbacks will be going at it. But, you know, both of those teams feel like that's a game they should win. So Absolutely. neither one respects the other a whole lot. Be right back. <laughs> Welcome back to Sports Talk on the Sports Talk Media Network. You can reach the guys with the South Carolina Education Lottery lucky number, 888-898-2525. That's 888-898-2525. Now back to Phil and Chris with a second hour of Sports Talk on the Sports Talk Media Network. Okay, we're back on Sports Talk, Sports Talk Media Network. On this Thursday night, Phil Kornblut, Chris Bergen, and Josh Cohen. Let's update the baseball once again. Top of the second. USC, Tennessee are 1-1. Clemson doing what they do, coming from behind now. After three, Tigers are trailing Boston College 6-4. to four, Over top, a three-run homer for the Tigers with two out in the bottom of the third. Gets them close. They're down 6-4. to four. Coastal Carolina's built a 5-1 lead on Marshall in the bottom of the third. College of Charleston has beaten Elon 14-10. to 10, So they edge Woo-hoo. closer to the 40-win mark for them. And Georgia College and State University is taking the 3-2 lead on North Greenville as they play in the top of the second of that playoff game up in Tigerville. Who Let's says the talk- college doesn't have football? <laughs> Say again? <laughs> I said, who says the College of Charleston does not have football? Well, they're scoring runs. <laughs> they put up two touchdowns today. By the way, speaking of Clemson, they have just announced that tomorrow's game, due to forecasted bad weather in the upstate uh, tomorrow evening, they're going to play tomorrow at 1 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. So I tell you what, man, it's like every weekend we're getting rain that's messing up these schedules. Every weekend. Yep. You know? It's like but we you live in the uh, Pacific Northwest. Hey, yeah, really. I mean, you have to adjust on the fly here, you know. All right, time for a visit with, speaking of adjusting his fly, I mean, adjusting on the fly, uh, let's welcome into Sports Talk for another edition of Morgan on the Move. He is Mike Morgan, brought to you by State Farm agent Gary Patterson. 35 years, Gary's been serving the real estate needs from Lugoff to Lexington and Columbia to Blythewood. Your auto, home, life insurance, and business insurance can all be handled by Gary, who spends countless hours helping South Carolinians with all their insurance needs. And he makes a difference in the community. Go check out GaryPatterson.net today, and he'll go over the best plans for you and your family. That's GaryPatterson.net. Brought to you by Love Chevy. Act now for springtacular savings on the best selection of new Chevys. I-26 at Harbison and at LoveChevy.com. Together, let's drive. All right, time to welcome in a man who has more sponsors. He has more sponsors than I can't come up with a cute line. I'll just say he has a lot of sponsors. He is Mike Morgan, Morgan on the move. Welcome in, sir. How are you? I'm well. How are you guys? We're doing terrific. Doing terrific. Wrapping up the regular season of college baseball. Can you believe we've come to the end of the line here as far as the regular season is concerned? I can. Uh, obviously, you know, the the situation surrounding Carolina and the importance of winning a game in that series against Tennessee, that's a little more drama than some other teams are, are going through right now. You know, you've got the race at the top between Kentucky and Tennessee, uh, and Tennessee fans would like to send a letter of gratitude to the Gamecocks for taking two out of three against Kentucky. That's a Kentucky team that might wind up the number one overall seed. Uh, And then you have a couple of teams kind of jockeying for position. And then for the first time in a while, there's there's at least a possibility if Carolina can't uh, do something here, scratch something here in uh, in Knoxville slash Hoover, that you could have to sweat out selection Sunday. And that's obviously what you want to avoid. And uh, a one win in Knoxville to me would would clinch it. I mean, you're in. There's no question about that. But uh, I wouldn't want to go into Selection Sunday losing, you know, seven in a row. That that would be uh, a little bit dicey. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, got off to a decent start. It's one one against Tennessee up in Knoxville. They're starting tie good. They're they're continuing to shuffle their rotation. Uh, Mike, you've been around baseball forever. 
I don't think you ever want to be in a position as a coaching staff of still hunting for your starting rotation going into the last weekend of the regular season, but that's kind of the position they find themselves in. Yeah, it's a it's a rough spot to be in. And and look, I, I I've covered enough teams, including enough Carolina teams. Most of them, of course, were very good and didn't have your your typical weaknesses. But every now and then there's a, a team that didn't hit real well, and so you keep mixing up the lineup, and no matter what you do, they still don't hit really well. Uh, and every now and then there's a team that struggles on the mound, and you can mix and match, and you hope to, to find the right formula for success with the rotation. Um, but I just think at the end of the day, it's kind of like all the, the, the people that were so obsessed with what day Eli Jones starts – you know, the bigger problem to me for the, for the last three weeks was that he wasn't getting anybody out. That's not a day of the week problem. Huh. That's a stuff problem. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, it, changing changing the calendar is not going to – it's still the same lineup. Whether you pitch on Fridays, Saturday, Thursday, it's still the same lineup. And you could make the argument it's actually harder in game one than it was in game two where they were throwing them. But, uh, no, it's a concern. Uh, you know, the, the, the lineup – which for a while there was struggling, has come on a bit. I understand Petrie's already hit a home run. I believe that's 20 for him. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but you've got to get better pitching. If this team is going to make any movement, even into the postseason once they get there, uh, you're, you're going to have to find some guys that you feel confident in. We know this team hasn't had a true ace really all year. Uh, you don't have to have that. It's nice. It's a luxury you'd love to have. But more importantly, they just don't have starters that are that you feel confident are going to give you a quality start right now, and that's problematic. Let's talk about Clemson. They are down at Boston College 8-4 to four. now. Boston College has tacked on two more runs in the top of the fourth, including their third homer of the day. And I've been saying for a while, Clemson's pitching looks extremely suspect to me for a team ranked as high as they are ranked. And, I mean, we're seeing more evidence of it here in this game against the worst team in the ACC in Boston College, and the Clemson pitching's getting tattooed. Um, and their defense is, hasn't helped either. Um, what do you make of them? I mean, are, are they going to have a long run in the postseason with the, with the pitching the way it's going right now? What do you foresee? Well, I mean, as, if, if, as it stands now, they're in great shape for a national seed, and obviously that helps. So, uh, you know, do they have – you know what I've noticed, is particularly in the SEC, and this might apply to college baseball in general, uh, I think it's a down year for pitching. I, I, if you look at the projected first-round picks, as I did the other day, and uh, Kylie McDaniel does a great job uh, for ESPN with that. Uh, Kylie's out of Atlanta. I've, I've gotten to know him rather well, and he, he's pretty spot on. He's kind of like the uh, – I don't know – the Mel Kuyper, but with not as good a hair yeah, uh, and maybe a little more accurate. Uh, but if you look at the top picks, you know, you will see Charlie Condon of Georgia. You will see Caglione of Florida. Uh, you will see the, um, I just forgot his name, the cat for, for Wake Forest. But, but most of the top 10 Kurtz. picks, the Kurtz, thank you. Most of the top 10 picks are hitters mm-hmm. and, and there's only a couple of SEC pitchers expected to go in the first round. Usually there's there's about three or four in the top ten. And, and so uh, there's been a lot of discussion. Coaches that I've talked to, there's there's a lot of, call it paranoia, call it, call it whatever you will. A lot of people think the bats are juiced, the balls are juiced. I mean, we're having a ridiculous amount of home runs. Uh, but some of it might be, this might be just a little bit of a down year for pitching overall. I don't see a Paul Skeens out there. Hagen Smith of Arkansas is terrific. But just, but just think, I mean, last year you had Smith and you had Skeens and you had Chase Burns, Burns of Tennessee, who's now at Wake Forest, who just shut down Clemson last week. I mean, it, it was a stronger year on the bump in 2023 than I think it's been in 2024. So that's a long way of saying Clemson might not be pitching dominant but maybe this is a year where not many teams are other than, mm-hmm. other than Arkansas, and Arkansas can't consistently hit. 
And stick your pipe and smoke it in there, Arkansas. <laughs> That's right. Damn skippy. <laughs> Mike Morgan, Morgan on the move here tonight on Sports Talk. And, Mike, you stole my thunder because I was going to ask you about the lack thereof of pitching. I mean, you look at South Carolina's team ERA. It's sitting around five. Phil already told you what Clemson's doing or not doing against Boston College. I think you laid it out really well. There's just not a lot of good pitching stabs in college baseball. Does that speak to a bigger problem at the high school level? when you get a kid who's a pretty good pitcher at the high school level, is Major League Baseball throwing so much money at them that they are skipping college to go straight and get ready for the pros? It's a great question, but but honestly, it's really the opposite. I've never seen more kids turn down a lot of money to mm-hmm. play in college for three years and then make more money when they get out on the other side. And then the kids that play at a big at a high level in college baseball – their trek to the big league. I mean, I mentioned Paul Skeens. He's already in the rotation for the Pirates. Right. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't that long ago he was pitching in Omaha. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a projected uh, ascension for Hagen Smith when he goes in the top five out of Arkansas as well. Whereas if you take the, the 18-year-old at a high school with the lightning bolt of an arm, chances are it, it's going to be years before he sees – uh, the show. It's going to be years of eight-hour bus rides and a, and a lot of uh, non-competitive, uh, somewhat apathetic games that, that you're going to have to get used to. So I, I think actually it's the opposite. I, I really just think it's an aberration. I, I, mm-hmm. I think next year we could be right back to where we were in 2023, where you've got stud pitchers all over the place that are high draft picks. I I just think for whatever reason this year, I mean, Vandy's staff is down. Florida staff is down. Those are two programs that routinely have incredibly deep, talented, uh, high draft pick staffs, and, and both of them have been less than stellar this year. So back to your conspiracy theory question, mm. and I think it's a valid one to ask. If it is indeed the case that the bats may be juiced to touch or the balls are, do you think the NCAA may start looking into this a little bit closer and say, look, we don't want 15 to 10 type ball games like the College of Charleston played today. We'd much prefer a six to five sort of pitcher's duel, for lack of a better term. I'm sure there's somebody on that committee, and I don't know who it is nowadays. You know, back back in the day, when they went to the BB core bats in 2011, if you remember the offense just completely got shut down and quite frankly, it was a boring game and Jack Leggett of Clemson led the way to say, okay, we've gone too far here. If we're going to deaden the bats, let's at least uh, liven up the ball. And they went to the flat seamed baseball, more similar to pro pro baseball and the ball travels farther off the bat. And that helped the offense. And I thought the game from that point on was playing as true as it, as it could be. I thought we really hit the sweet spot. We were like Goldilocks. We found the bed. We found the bed, the bat, the ball that was just right. <laughs> and, and now uh, I, I, I think clearly something is amiss. And I don't know what it is. You know, I, sometimes you talk to coaches and there's a little bit of paranoia in there. But when you have the when you have the offensive productivity that you do right now, it's more than just oh guys are lifting weights and oh the pitching's not that great. That, to me, there's something a little more there. Don't know that we've ever asked you about his career, but as it starts to come to a close, what it, kind of impact do you think Gary Gilmore has had on college baseball at Coastal? And maybe oh. as he moves on, he was telling us the other night he's looking at the possibility of trying to get a. Uh, sort of uh, child cancer day at all three levels and raise money for mm-hmm. children's hospitals around the country to try and help battle that insidious disease. I mean, what kind of impact do you believe he's had? Well, first off, to, to your last point, it just speaks to, to what a gem of a human being he is, and, and that's the most important thing, and that will that will uh, be as big a part of his legacy as anything else uh, and how he's affected people in a positive way. You know, as a coach, I just I can't say enough about what he's done. I mean, anytime you take a program from the lower levels and you put it uh, on top of the mountain and you win a, a World, Se- World Series championship the way they did in 2016, I mean, we've had a lot of teams flirt with that. We've had 
the dark horse teams, if you will, get to Omaha. But to go in there and win it, I, I don't know if we're going to see that again, quite honestly. That was that, that's so phenomenal uh, and so difficult to do that it, I, I just don't know with, with the way the system is set up now with NIL and the, the, the rich kind of getting richer, it's going to be very difficult for another program to make a run like that. I, I, you know, Fresno State was, was what, 2008, if I'm not mistaken. That was obviously a major story. They knocked off Georgia. Um, but but it, went, it was another, another what, 20 years or so? No, another uh, eight, eight, eight years. years. Eight mm-hmm. years, yeah. yeah. No, no, I, I was told there'd be no math. Uh, eight <laughs> years before that happened again. And uh, I, I think it might be 50 years before we see uh, another mid-major win the whole thing. Speaking of mid-majors having a heck of a year and a coach you know well, <clears throat> job that Chad Holbrook is doing this year at the college, closing in on 40 wins. Of course, fortunately for them, they're in a league that I would imagine will only have one team advance, and that will be the tournament champion. So they're going to have to do it all over again next week. But what about the job he's done this year with the Kooks? Well, uh, full disclosure, I've known Chad for a while. Uh, he was he, – got the job as an assistant when I was still doing Gamecock baseball games, uh, have remained uh, close with Chad and, and on the inside the Gamecock show each and every weekday from 11 to two on the chief sports network. Uh, Cheap plug. Check your, yes, check your local, uh, <laughs> YouTube, Spotify, all the good, uh, outlets out there for a terrific show with uh, yes. Jamie Bradford and JC Sherbert. But I digress. Uh, no, I, we we have him on every week, and so uh, we've kind of gotten to to cover his journey. And you know what I love about it, Phil, and you can appreciate this because I know mm-hmm. you've had a lot of regular segments with former coaches on your show over the years. When you get to hear a coach, because every coach has been fired, right? I mean, every coach has had a job that it didn't go the way he wanted it to, and obviously that was the case with Chad at, at, at Carolina. But you learn from that. And it makes you even a, a better coach, and you. It also makes you a better guy to talk about, you know, the the, the trials, the tribulations, the hurdles you got to clear in order to be successful. And I think he's taken that experience, and it's really helped him at College of Charleston. I'm, I'm not surprising that he's doing a great job over there. Yeah, got a big win today, opening a series against Elon. I've come up with my line. I said earlier, Mike Morgan, who has. More sponsors than I couldn't come up with a wrap-up line to that. Mike Morgan, who has more sponsors than Richard Petty in NASCAR in 1966. Yeah, yeah. It was yeah. he was an STP guy, wasn't he? He was an STP guy, <laughs> yes, but he had a bunch know. of others. He had a bunch of others. You know, those NASCAR oh. guys were loaded with sponsors. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you know, I've only got two so far: the great Gary Patterson, and of course our. Terrific friends that love Chevy in Columbia, mm. but yes. there's always room for more. I know you suggested some rather scandalous uh, spots. Uh, we're not taking on Platinum Plus, Phil. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's too bad. Uh, well, Teddy Hefner's yeah. got them locked down. <laughs> <laughs> Teddy's probably doing remotes there tonight. <laughs> He's got a lifetime contract, ironclad. <laughs> He's playing the music on Satellite One. <laughs> Uh, but you know what? There's a place in Birmingham that still has a seat reserved for you. Sammy's. Oh, Remember Sammy's? Remember the great Sammy's know. in Birmingham? Yeah. I, yeah. I heard stories about it. I, I believe that was the only place of its kind that had a security guard the moment you walked in. That's right. Just to make sure you didn't see anything you weren't supposed to. It was a real downer when you walked into <laughs> Sammy's and saw cops in there with guns on the hips. That kind of took yeah. the buzz. Kind of took the buzz away from you. <laughs> Mike, if we may, before we let you run, I wanted to get your take on the uh, Formula One race you attended, what, a week or so ago down in Miami. Did you go to Formula One? Oh, my gosh. I I went to my first ever F1 race in Miami. Uh, In fact, it really was my first race, period. I'm Mm. not a big car racing guy, uh, but I I had a terrific time. It's obviously different than NASCAR. Uh, I'm sure NASCAR fans could tell you how much better NASCAR is. I'm sure F1 fans would tell you. I, I don't care. I mean, I just love this, the, the feel and the sound of the cars revving around the track. I didn't know a single driver. I didn't care. 
Uh, it was a good time. Very good time. Those cars are really, really fast, aren't they? <laughs> well, they are. When it's F1, you got to, you know, you got to pivot all over the place. You're not just going on an oval track. Mm-hmm. So it's it's uh, to watch those guys do that. Uh, I can only imagine how many times I would have run into a wall. Uh, you know, Mike, maybe. knowing you as I do, you you do kind of yeah. resemble a Formula One driver from say. Uh, uh, Argentina, maybe, or uh, you know, somewhere <laughs> over there across the pond. You kind of, you have yeah. a, you have a sort of a European look to you. I can see you climbing in there and uh, you know, dropping it down in fifth gear and taking yeah. it hard into the corner. You know, I I would uh, I would love to do that. I would love. Speaking of sponsors, I'm sure they uh, they have more than just Gary Patterson of State Farm and Love Chevy. <laughs> They've got some they got some heavy hitters over there on their cars and probably make a quite a bit of money off of those sponsors and uh yeah they they certainly don't uh hurt the uh, female department either it's, it's oh. not a bad gig if you want to be an f1 driver <laughs> there's worse ways to make a living well you know I, I, you know your middle name is ferrari mike ferrari morgan so you know you do yes, have it yes. you do have it in your bloodstream so mike, mike, the one thing i do know about formula yeah. one if you have to ask how much it costs to get into the sport you can't afford to get into the sport absolutely yeah yeah <laughs> absolutely it's, uh, it's a little pricey it's a little pricey. hey before we let you go the seas mike and i have common uh, enthusiasm for the boston celtics uh, looking pretty good. I don't think the Celtics have even played as a team their overall best game in the playoffs yet because Tatum is shooting like 26% from three in the playoffs. So it's time to put it all together when we get to this uh, Eastern Conference Finals. Yeah, uh, for the right to get uh, smoked by the Joker in the finals. Nah. No, I, I it, you know, uh, look, it's a great story, but, but Boston's got to do a better job of of finishing you know, you, you you got a lot of talent, and there, there's so much. I mean, the East is not good this year, and, and the teams that were good are all hurt. So, I mean, they basically yeah. have been gift wrapped a trip to the finals. Uh, and I want to see the Nuggets back in there. I love watching Denver play. I love watching the Joker play. That series of Minnesota, to me, has been uh, immensely entertaining. I called a number of Anthony Edwards games yeah. it, at uh, Georgia, and, and he is obviously going to be – must see TV uh, if you're an NBA fan for a, a long time to come. But there's no better player in the game if you just want to win. There's no better player in the game right now than Jokic. There just isn't. Yeah. He is a tough defend, as they say. But I will roll with the C's this year. Got to get it done this year. If Horford is knocking in 20-plus and knocking down some threes like he did last night, Makes the Celtics awfully tough to beat. <laughs> I'm just waiting on Tatum to put it all together. I mean, he has not had – I know he's scoring because he said, look, he's not worried about his scoring. He'll go and get his points. But his outside shooting has got to get better. And Derek White I did think, not have a great series this this second round. Had a great first round, but not a great second round scoring-wise. That is great Celtics analysis. I think Walter from Goose Creek on line three would like to uh, break that down a little Walter. further. Walter. Walter, go right ahead. Let's talk some Celtics tonight. <laughs> really playing into that target audience. Since we don't really have much anything else going tonight, we can talk with Walter about the Celtics. Mike, thank yes. you, and we will Thanks, talk Mike. to you next week. That's Mike Ferrari Morgan That's joining right. us here on Sports Talk. F1, F, from F1 fame straight to Sports Talk. There you go. Peace thank out. you, Haas. Talk to Thanks, you next buddy. week. All right, Mike Morgan, Morgan on the move. Tennessee has Peace. taken a 2-1 to lead on the Gamecocks in the bottom of the third. Hang on a second. Boston College now 8-5 to on Clemson. In the bottom of the fourth, Tigers have a runner on second. Did somebody homer? Uh, no, Gerald, a single to left center. Coastal up 5-2, to two, middle of five. What you got? I was going to say, for Ty Good's sake, just don't pitch to Kristen Moore. He's hit two solo home runs. He's oh. the difference in the game right now. He's their mm-hmm. leadoff hitter batting 380. And for Mike, just don't put stuff on Twitter you don't want us to see and ask you about the following week. Happened to oh, see yeah. a picture of he and his lovely bride at the F1 race, and I thought, well, sure, that'd be fun to find out how much he enjoyed Miami. Well, if there's anything on Twitter that Mike Morgan really enjoys is Mike Morgan. So uh, <laughs> you're, you're going to see – you're going to live uh, – what's that word? You're going to live uh, – Vicariously. I was going to say vicariously. That's a good word. 
Uh, yeah, you're going to live vicariously through Mike Morgan as he travels the world. And you look real you- comfortable over there, Phil. Who may? Oh, shoot, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of gotta, falling asleep I, I was, with melatonin. I was, I was almost doing a Gamecock Larry there during that. The, during, while you were asking questions, I was about to reach Gamecock Larry status, uh, leaning back. All right, we'll be back in just a moment. <laughs> No better time than now to give you the recruiting report tonight right here on Sports Talk. It is brought to you by Seawells, where tomorrow, Chris, you ought to come into town tomorrow, and since you're going to be the big dog on Sports Talk, be the big dog over at Seawells. It's a roast beef Friday. I know it is a big day, and I was actually considering it because the Carolina Panthers are having one of their events over at USC tomorrow. They're Uh doing a play 60 deal where some of their players are coming down, and then they're also going to the – South Carolina Department of Juvenile Justice, I believe, tomorrow as well. So the Panthers are actually going to be in Columbia. Super. You know, That's they, right they next kind of to my forgotten, house. They've kind of forgotten where about South Carolina in the last couple of years. So it's good for them to realize that, hey, there might be Panthers fans south of the border as well. Josh, did you just say you used to live at DJJ? <laughs> I, live, like, I live about a mile away from DJJ. I'm right oh, the road. Okay. I got you. I got yep. you. I, miss, I misheard. Well, I mean, my dad worked there, so. Ah, yeah. Platt carry little, did he carry a little something on the hip? He carried a little piece of metal on the hip. No, he was a teacher. He was oh, a teacher okay. there. Yeah, bro, bro was a teacher. You didn't know that? Uh, I mean, I knew he was a teacher. Didn't know he was a teacher there. He was like a principal yeah. there. Yep. And now he's a restaurant tour. Er, Grouches Deli and Blythewood, come see us. There you go. That'll be uh, five thousand dollars for that plug. By the way, yeah, I'll look for the check in the mail. Uh, C. Wells, it's a uh, roast beef Friday tomorrow. That's to be celebrated. It's 11 to 2. You don't want to miss it. I'll have to miss it. Chris, you shouldn't miss it. Josh, you need to get over there so you don't miss it. We encourage everybody to turn out for a roast beef Friday. And for the very best in the catering business, that too. The folks at C. Wells have been at it for nearly 80 years, so they know what they're doing, and they do it extremely well. And their phone number is 803 771 7385 online at Seawells Catering SC.com. Clemson offensive line coach Matt Luke was in Brookline, Massachusetts earlier this week to watch offensive tackle Hardy Watts 6'6, 285 in a workout. Luke was one of several recruiters to drop in at Dexter High as the team held an open practice to give the coaches a closer look at some of their talent. The biggest draw was Watts. He said it was a great experience. Great to work with his guys, helping his guys get uh, recruited. After the workout, he met with Luke and his uh, family came in and met with Luke as well. Um, He also talked to coaches from Alabama, Duke, Michigan, Boston College, and they are all telling him, you know, that they want him, uh, that uh, they need him, uh, and, uh, you know, there's a spot for him on their respective offensive lines because he's a versatile Offensive lineman, that makes him very appealing to these guys. So the problem is, is, and this is where Clemson is a little bit stubborn, they only do one weekend of official visits. You know, Dabo Sweeney didn't want to do summer official visits like people started doing. He wanted to stick with the traditional uh, in-season official visits. But he eventually came around to having one weekend for all his official visits in the summer. I mean, you know, if you can make it work this way, it's a great plan. But, you know, you got to – there are some players who have other things going on the first weekend in June, the last weekend of May that spills over in the first weekend in June. And since you're only having one official visit weekend, you're not going to have a chance to get these guys in any other time in the summer. That's the situation here with Watts. He's got something going on with his school that weekend, a conflict. And so he can't make it. He might come in for a midweek, if possible, on an unofficial and kind of turn it into an official, or he might visit for a game this fall. So, you know, Clemson kind of rolling the dice here that their appeal will stand out and and keep them in the hunt here as he takes other official visits. Now, he hasn't set up any other official visits just yet, and he's talking to a number of schools. He plans to set these official visits 
in the next week or so. Uh, he's been to Clemson once before. He was there for a spring practice on March 24th, and he was really impressed. He said, quote, I really love Clemson. I love what Coach Sweeney is about. I love what the message is from the staff and what the program is about. Clemson itself, the campus is absolutely beautiful, and the guys in that locker room are amazing as well. Uh, so that's what he had to say about Clemson. He said he would love to commit by the end of summer, but he called that a soft deadline. A lot depends on when he's able to visit Clemson. If he has to wait until the fall, then he would push that commitment date back to give him the chance to visit. That's assuming he doesn't go ahead and commit. Like he said, when it hits him, it hits him. That's assuming he doesn't go ahead and commit prior to. USC and Clemson target offensive tackle David Sanders of Charlotte going to visit Georgia again this weekend. Uh, So he went out to Nebraska last weekend. This is an unofficial. Georgia's having this thing called a scavenger hunt where they bring in recruits and (laughs) – I think they place uh, bags full of uh, full of money all around money, Athens. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, no, we're just kidding. Georgia would they never supply do them with that. the cars to speed around town to find the find uh, the bags of money too. I'm telling you, <laughs> I, you know, I I don't want to say anything like that about our neighbors to the uh, what are they kind of towards the northwest, um, but you know it's Georgia. So draw your own conclusion about what they're looking for. I mean, I'm sure they're not looking for Butterfingers uh, in, in in brown paper bags, you know. I'm sure it's a little bit more substantial than Milky Ways and Butterfingers. Skittles. And, and, and extra cheese Doritos, you know. Uh, anyway, he's going back to Georgia uh, for another visit this weekend. And Heathwood Hall cornerback Onus Conanbani, he was offered by Auburn. And there you go with the recruiting report tonight. Here on Sports Talk. Try to keep you up to date with things with things on our website, sportstalksc.com, and on our Twitter, use the hashtag ST Recruiting. Oh my. Five to one Tennessee in the top of the fourth. What has happened here, sir? Homers, homers, and more Ooh. home runs in that yeah, really. homer friendly ballpark. I mentioned Christian Moore had hit two already to put him up two one. They added a three run home run later in the inning. Christian Moore, by the way, is a guy you probably shouldn't pitch to. As I mentioned, he now holds the single-season home run record for Tennessee. He's hit 26 this year. And, oh, by the way, he's also their career leader in home runs with 53. Wow. And how about this stat that uh, Jordan Kay of the uh, State Newspaper tweeted out a few minutes ago. Since the start of the Georgia series last week, Hmm. USC pitching has now given up 14 home runs in 30 innings. That's almost hard to believe. Um, you can't you can't try to be that bad. I think I would, ch- I would challenge that. I, how many did he say? Because I think Georgia. Fourteen. Hit, well, he must not be counting one. He might not be counting the last one because Georgia hit twelve, I believe, and Tennessee. Okay, hit and three. Tennessee's got three. Three. Yep. Yeah. So it would be fifteen. Yeah. That's even worse. <laughs> As a matter of fact, they brought the Gamecocks to tears with that last home run. Uh, nice. You like that, huh? A guy I named knew. Tears hit the home run. I guess he pronounced it Tears. Maybe it's Tears. T e a r s. Tears. Yeah. Three run homer makes it five to one as they go to the bottom of the fourth. So the Gamecocks got that one run in the first. They've only had two hits. They've only had two hits in the game thus far, and that uh, let's see here. They got the homer from Petri in the first. They went down in order in the second. They uh, had a um, – Brindling was hit by a pitch to lead off the third after Tennessee made a pitching change, but then the next three all struck out. And in the fourth, the Gamecocks um, got a leadoff walk, but then a double play ground ball, then a double by Reeves. Boy, that double play ground ball was painful. No, no doubt. And then uh, Lee Croy struck out, so – um, sounds to me like the Gamecocks are striking out a lot. Let's see. They have struck out six times through um, four times at the plate, and they have just the two hits. Uh, eight to six, Boston College leading Clemson. They're in the top of the fifth. And two outs, runners on second and third for Boston College. And uh, Clemson's pitching. They've come on with McGovern now. After Marshall went two innings, gave up three hits, couple of runs, a couple of walks, a couple of strikeouts. And after Darden started, went two innings, gave up four hits, six runs, only two earned, 
and a couple of strikeouts. McGovern, not George, um, just McGovern. <laughs> hey, man, it's a Thursday night. We're up against baseball. <laughs> We're a little wacky here. I'm wondering um, how many of our listeners, out, I would think several, but I'm guaranteeing our producer has no idea who George McGovern is. He probably doesn't. Yeah, I have no clue. No clue at all. <laughs> now, you don't need to know. He didn't win the presidency. Uh, they got out of that issue in the uh, top of the fifth, second and third, two outs. They got out of it, so Boston College does not add to the lead. It's 8-6, to six, middle of the fifth. Coastal Carolina 5-2, to two, middle of the sixth. College of Charleston has won its game tonight, 14-10 to 10, uh, over Elon. Give you some other scores. Winthrop is leading at Charleston Southern, 3-2. to two. Bucks have the tying run on second with two outs, 3-2, to two, playing at Winthrop. Sanford beat Wofford, 10-5. Louisville beat Notre Dame, 5-1. to one. LSU leading Ole Miss, 5-1, to one, bottom of the sixth. That would be um, somewhat beneficial for South Carolina since Ole Miss has 11 wins. If LSU wins, it'll give them 11 wins. Mercer leads the Citadel 3-1, to one, top of the eighth. Poor Bulldogs, they are 1-17 and 17 in the SOCON. Greensboro and Upstate are 8-8 eight, eight in the top of the sixth. Georgia leading Florida 7-2, to two, uh, top of the sixth. That would be beneficial for the Gamecocks since the Gators have 11 wins. And Virginia leading Virginia Tech 6-2, to two, top of the sixth. Kentucky is beating Vanderbilt. This would be good for South Carolina. I mean, what I'm saying is trying to hold on to the seventh spot. It really doesn't right. matter, seven spot, eight spot, but trying to hold on to the seventh spot. Uh, this would be good for South Carolina. Kentucky leading Vanderbilt, who has 12 league wins, 7-1, uh, to one, bottom of the third. Mississippi State with a one nothing lead on Missouri, bottom three. Auburn one nothing on Alabama, top three. Florida State one nothing on Georgia Tech after three. Duke leading North Carolina two nothing. That's in the top of the fourth. Pittsburgh Miami scoreless top of the third, and Presbyterian blasted Asheville seventeen to nothing. PC having Ooh. a having a very sweet year. They had that was a one hitter. Whoever pitched for PC, a pitcher or a group of pitchers. Allowed one hit today, 17-0. PC now 27-25 and 16-6 and in the Big South. i got to believe, and I'll bring up the Big South standings here real quick, got to believe that PC is on top or near the top, if not on top, of the Big South. They are on top by a half game over a high point at 16-6. and So, still, they got to go win their tournament to oh, yeah. get into the NCAA tournament. But they've done it before. Elton PC Pollard has, may be on his second trip to the NCAA tournament. They have done it before. Okay, um, let's go to the break. We'll come back and update. Oh, I'm sorry to tell you, MJ cannot be with us tonight. He's got some deadlines he's trying to meet writing-wise. Remember, he writes for European outlets, so they're like five hours ahead. So he's got to mm-hmm. get stuff in for those who still have deadlines. You know, the Internet doesn't have a deadline. Um So, uh, MJ will be with us tomorrow night, though. uh, We plan for him to be with us at 630 to talk about the first two rounds of the PGA. And we'll be back to update the leaderboard. Relax this summer with a promotional rate on select travel purchases with your Founders Federal Credit Union credit card. Now through August 31st, get 6.99% APR for six months on qualifying purchases, including airfare, hotels, restaurants, and cruise lines. Don't let interest rates slow you down this summer. Visit foundersfcu.com travel to learn more. Not a Founders member yet? Founders has the financial tools you need and the personalized service you deserve. Stop by an office or visit foundersfcu.com com to learn more about founders and see if you qualify for membership on march 1st 2025 the promotional apr will revert to the effective apr as previously disclosed call 800-845-1644 for details about credit costs and terms membership qualification required
I'm attorney Jim Corbett. That's the sound of a big hit on you and your car or truck. I've been an attorney for more than 30 years, helping people who get injured in car wrecks and truck wrecks. If you have serious injuries, call Jim Corbett, 803 765 2968, or email me at jim at jimcorbettattorney.com. That's C O R B E T T. I don't get paid unless I recover for you. Jim Corbett Attorney, for your best recovery from a big hit, 803 765 2968, or jim at jimcorbettattorney.com. You've put in the work for your education. The extra early, extra late, extra, extra work. That's because you understand education opens doors to better pay, better opportunities, and a better you. Being educated about playing the lottery is no different. It helps you be a better player, one who knows when to play and when to take a rain check. The lottery's a game, so let's keep it fun. Learn more at sceducationlottery.com slash better you. Don't you cry no more. One more score to update here. Uh, North Greenville trailing, trailing uh, Georgia College and State University 6-2, to two, top of the fifth. And what did you have, Chris? The perfect season still intact. Oh, you're keeping an eye on that. Yes, you've heard Jim Tillman talk about Maryland Eastern Shore. They lost today to Sacred Heart 18 to nothing. And that's coming off a 22 to 12 loss to Delaware State this past Saturday. Uh, They are now 0-46 on the year. They've got two games left to go to win their first game of the year and avoid perfection the wrong way. Wow. Well, nobody won. And by the way, his name is Jacob McGovern, who uh, who entered the the game for Clemson. Um, nobody wants to go winless, but I mean, then again, there's something to be said about going zero and what forty eight. Of course, if they were yeah. if they were a uh, a five A 5A football team in South Carolina, they'd still make the playoffs. <laughs> Would they There's not? Really they'd, good chance. They'd there would still be make the really playoffs. good chance. Yeah. They, they might be the only ones who wouldn't get in because they didn't beat anybody. You know, you only need to win about one game to qualify for the uh, state playoffs in, in South Carolina. But, hmm. yeah, that's that's got to be tough. And you you want to talk about hitting the transfer portal. Do you take any of the players that are on that team if they want to leave because their team has been so bad? Really? Probably not. <laughs> got to feel sorry just, for those kids. Unless there's just one guy who, who, uh, who tears it up. You know, mm-hmm. just they just score out, some runs now. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to mention this. I tweeted this, retweeted this because it came out the other day. Everick Sullivan is a new head basketball coach at Eastside High School. He was named to that position uh, just the other day. So Everick Sullivan, who was a great high school basketball player in our state, ended up going to Louisville and playing there. And then I think he went and played a little uh, professional basketball. And he's been coaching, coaching some college basketball. Now he's taking the job at um, Eastside High School. So back in his uh, neck of the woods. I wonder how Hillcrest feels about that. You know, him going to somewhat of a rival in Greenville County. Yeah, I mean, um, I guess, hey, you got to go with his jobs. Sure. You know, you got to go with his. He was a phenomenal, phenomenal basketball player. Yes, he was. Uh, Were he and Ray Allen, were they contemporaries? I'm trying to. I'm thinking that oh he played at Hillcrest. Of course, Ray Allen played at Hillcrest of Sumter. I don't want to confuse the two. Were they contemporaries? They, I, I think they came down the pipe about the same, about the same time. But I'm not 100 percent sure on that. Um, take a look at the leaderboard of the PGA as we turn the corner ahead for a home here. Uh, most everybody is in at this point in time. There's still some on the course. Uh, Xander Shoffley, 62. That's going to hold up to be your first-round lead, of course. Tony Finau at minus 665, along with Thigala. I'm sorry, Thigala. Shahid Thigala, 6 under 65. Uh, Roy McElroy's right there, 5 under 66. Robert McIntyre also at 5 under. Tom Hoagie is in at 5 under 66. Tom Kim also at 5 under. Thomas Dietrich. And Colin Morikawa, they are all in at five under. Ben Coles, Brooks Kepka, Taylor Moore, Alex Noren, Austin Eckroat, they are all in at four under 67. On the course at four under, playing the last, Scotty Scheffler. Uh, Alejandro Tosti is on the course at four under. He's got two holes to go. Mark Hubbard 
three holes to play. He's four under. So those are the guys uh, up near the top of the leaderboard. Our only state connection, well, we have a couple of state connections. Uh, Phil Mickels, I'm sorry, uh, Dustin Johnson, uh, plus 273 for him. And Lucas Glover, even par 71. Tiger Woods, plus 172. Phil Mickelson, uh, plus 374. And, of course, a lot of the talk yesterday, they had their press conferences with the the Chiefs of the PGA, and all the talk was about what's going to happen with Live Golf, the talk of some kind of a merger, the talk about uh, signing this agreement with the Saudi Arabian bank to get a whole bunch of money um, to kind of create this new PGA Tour arrangement. A lot of controversy over that. Um, so the future of of golf, the way we've known it forever and ever, is still very much up in the air because mm-hmm. they haven't. Uh, we've had people leave. The, they got these various boards that make these decisions, and we've seen like Roy McIlroy drop off the board. Um, I think his name is Jimmy Dunn, um, who was the one who brokered a deal. The the deal that was supposed to be done like back in December, January, that was supposed to get done, hasn't gotten done. He dropped off the board because he said nobody was listening to him. Um, so they got you know you've had a lot of turnover there. So I, I don't know you know when they're going to resolve it and what it's going to look like when it's all resolved. I just know that people. It's like I mentioned Dustin Johnson. He still plays golf, but we never talk about him anymore. Right. Exactly. Yeah, you know, we just and we that, just don't talk about it, and nobody's really paying attention to live golf or TV. It's like, and I love this guy. And I can't. Uh, what's his name? Um, the commentator on the Golf Channel, the controversial commentator. He played the game for a long time. Um, Dali. Chambly, Chambly. Yeah, Randall Chambly. Yeah, I mean he speaks his mind. Mm-hmm. That's why I love the guy. He speaks his mind. He said last night. He goes, look. Nobody's watching Live Golf. He says it's not like Live Golf has come in and turned the world, you know, turned the world upside down on golf. That's why he's a little bit astonished. Why, you know, maybe you know, there's this this give in to, to Live Golf. These these accommodations that are being made because he's like, you know, their television ratings are in the toilet. Uh, they, they still can't don't figure have... out the reason. They don't. They don't need television ratings. The players don't care. Right. I mean, the Saudis have more money than anybody on the planet, and they are willing to throw all of that money as we see them starting to enter into professional sports here in the United States. They'll throw money at, after, you know, bad money after bad money. They don't care, and the players certainly don't, or they wouldn't play on the tour. Mm-hmm. They, they are making more money than they could possibly make on the PGA Tour. It doesn't matter about the ratings. That's the bigger problem. They've got to find a way to come to grips with the salary gap if you will, between playing 54 holes on the live tour and making $2 billion versus 72 holes on the PGA tour. And if you get cut, you don't get paid. I mean, they're there. Those are the bigger problems, not the ratings, because you're right. I mean, you know what? I don't know where to find live golf. It's up on the CW. Yeah. But when you start taking away the top players, you know, it's like the USFL when it first started against the NFL, the one thing it had, it had some top players. It wasn't viable very long, but when the USFL first got going, it got some of the top-notch players, and that's what made it viable. Same thing here with the golf. Good point. Good point. So we'll see what happens with that, and you can talk with MJ in detail about that tomorrow. Mm-hmm. One last look at the baseball, and good news for South Carolina. I got good news and bad news. The good news is they've stopped the home run string by Tennessee, <laughs> but the bad news is they gave up an RBI double. So it's 6-1. to one. Good is still on the mound for the Gamecocks. He's hanging in there. He's trying to eat up some innings for sure. Uh, He has gone four innings, five hits, six runs, all earned. He's walked four. He has struck out four. Control's been an issue. Yep. And he's thrown three wild pitches. So Gamecocks are down six to one. Clemson has tied it up with two runs in the bottom of the fifth. It is eight to eight. And the Tigers in the fifth, you had, um, looks like you had a couple of error, had an error. That led to uh, runs being scored for the Tigers, so they have yeah, tied it up. Mm-hmm. They've tied it up at eight. Uh, Coastal Carolina, bottom of the seventh at Marshall, leading six to three. So there you go. And of course, Charleston won fourteen to ten. Okay, I'm going to earlier night. about Eric yeah. Sullivan and Ray Allen. Sullivan was actually about five years, four or five years older than Ray. 
Really? So they may have played on the you know junior circuit, but they did not cross paths in high school because Sullivan graduated in um, 87, 88, and Ray Allen graduated in 92, 93. Because that's when he started his career at UConn in 93. Very good. All right, I'm out of here tomorrow. What you got planned? Enjoy. We are going to hopefully catch up with, well, I don't want to give it out until it's affirmative, but we will talk plenty of golf. We'll talk plenty of baseball uh, on the show tomorrow night. Take phone calls, hear from Gamecock Larry if we can keep him awake. Mm-hmm. All that fun stuff. And, and we're going to have a special NASCAR. guest or two. Yes. And you'll have George to talk golf as well. So you'll have mm-hmm. a great show. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Chris. And thank you, Josh. Have a great night, everybody.